we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, this is the second in our uh, virtual BWP uh, series that we are doing in lieu of uh, our meeting that had to be canceled. Um, but we are really pleased to be able to continue these uh, discussions um, given that we can't meet in person and make use of our online capabilities to still um, engage on these important topics and um, keep in touch and not have to wait a year before we um, have these conversations. Um, so today's topic is uh, advances in habitat suitability modeling and range mapping to support conservation decisions. Uh, Regan Smythe from NatureServe will moderate um, and we're going to hear uh, from NatureServe Canada and some uh, programs in the U.S. about uh, what's been going on uh, with HSM and uh, range mapping. Um, <clears throat> if you weren't aware, uh, we are doing these sessions every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, next uh, Thursday is um, a, a session we're calling What's Your Status? And it's just a uh, look at some snapshots of status and ranking assessments that, have, that are going on across the network, both in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and we, on the 21st, will be having a presentation on IMAP invasives. So look for the emails if you haven't registered already to register for those webinars. And uh, we look forward to uh, bringing you more um, webinars uh, after the 21st. Um, so just so everyone's aware, we're using a Zoom webinar platform. All attendees are muted and uh, cannot uh, turn on their video. Um, you can use the chat or the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Uh, there will be time during the presentations for questions um, later on. Um, we are recording this session and the recording will be available to anyone who wants to view it on our website uh, once this uh, session is over. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Regan. All right, thank you, Allison. Um, as Allison said, I'm Regan Smythe. I'm the Director of Spatial Analysis here at NatureServe, and we're really excited today to be uh, really offering a look um, across the continent and advances in how we map the location of um, the, the um, you know, both the north of species across North America. Um, that are at risk. So we'll be starting off, as Allison said, with Christine Kerwissen from um, NatureServe Canada about their range mapping effort there uh, before moving to the United States and talking a bit about um, NatureServe's map of biodiversity importance, which we recently completed. Um, but really looking ahead from that, we'll give a brief overview of what that project was all about, but more so, you know, now that we've completed that effort, where does that leave us as a network in terms of our ability to produce habitat suitability models um, for imperiled species across the US? And so I'll, I'll start that with a brief overview, but then hand it over to um, a few different members of the NatureServe network for um, kind of five minute lightning talks on where, where we're headed next from the MOBI project. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Christine. Thanks, Regan. All right. So hopefully you should be able to see my screen now. Oh, uh, hang on. Can everyone see my screen now? We yep, you're good. We can. Okay. Perfect. All right. So first of all, I just wanted to thank um, Allison for setting up this virtual version of BWB. It's really nice that we can uh, stay connected, although we are all far apart from each other. 
So today I'm going to be talking about the Ecosystem-Based Automated Range Map Project, also known as EBAR. So as mentioned earlier, I work for NatureServe Canada. My name is Christine Terwissen, and I'm the National Coordinator of this project. So first I want to talk about our general methodology that we've been using for the project, but I also wanted to mention that this is all based on work from uh, Northwest Territories, British Columbia, and the Oregon NatureServe programs. So with our project, we started with data mining. So that involved collecting data from various sources to create accurate range maps um, with, from the best available data. We then put that all into an auto generation process, which used Python code to populate ecoshapes with species presence information. And I'll be going into each one of these points in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. So we then took all these auto generated maps and uh, are going to have them expert reviewed securely and efficiently using an online app, which is based on the Mobi code. We then intend to publish all of our maps. Um, they will be available at no cost on various platforms. And our intention is to have them available in formats that are gonna allow for program-specific customization. And one really uh, sort of key factor of the project is that we're going to allow for continual improvement. So anytime we have access to new data or expertise, we've developed the infrastructure to easily make these improvements using the online app. So what did our data mining process actually look like? So obviously we started within the network and I really wanna thank everyone who supported um, supplying element occurrences and source features. That's such an important uh, source of information for any of our products. But obviously not all species are tracked. So we also went to online platforms like GBIS, Bison and iDigiBio. We also uh, have a partnership with iNaturalist.ca, which allowed us to access unobscured records from that platform. Then we also reached out to academics and museums. We did literature searches and where possible incorporated range maps and critical habitat from reliable sources. So what did we do with all that data? So obviously the first step is to import it all. So again, we used Python tools for, to incorporate all of our spatial and tabular data into our standard, excuse me, standardized template. And we also developed some tools to help us with taxonomy. So I think everyone here is very familiar with the joys of synonyms and managing all of that. We also were able to employ our scripts that allowed us to efficiently download from the various online platforms. But obviously data is messy. So we wanted to make sure that we were only including the most um, high value information. So we only imported data if it had an observation date, a coordinate, and an uncertainty distance less than 32 kilometers or 19.88 miles for anyone who's in the US. So we only included research grade and naturalist records because we wanted to ensure that um, it had gotten a once over. We obviously excluded fossils from any of the museum data sources. And we did uh, attempt to remove duplicates, but obviously that is not perfect. And if anyone has a magical way to get rid of duplicates, please give me a call. Um, so then put all of this into the database and the technical aspects of that uh, are that it's deployed on an ArcGIS enterprise server, which is hosted on a Microsoft Azure virtual computer and pulled from PostGIS geodatabases. And I'm really excited to say that we currently have about 3.6 million species occurrences for 2,473 species. So how did we actually go about auto-generating our maps? So we started with what we're calling our EcoShape mosaics, and we have this built all the way from Alaska to Canada, the US and Mexico. And these are polygons of ecoregions, ecodistricts, or other representations of ecosystems. And an important component of this is this allowed us to start with predefined baselines that eliminate the need to manually draw or edit range boundaries. So we then included our species data that I defined in the previous slide through our data mining process. And we buffered all of these using the uncertainty distance from the data provider. So I wanna note that we are aware that this might result in an overestimation of the ranges 
but we felt like it was important to include the uncertainty distance, especially since it was provided by the original source. So we then combine this using Python tools to actually populate the eco shape with presence values. So the presence values are present, which means that there's actually species data underlying the eco shape or expert opinion, where the person is highly confident that they know that the species is there. The next option would be presence expected, which means that there's no underlying species data, but an expert has provided opinion that they believe it's there, or the eco shape intersects with either um, a range map or suitable habitat. And finally, the last category is historical, which means that all the data within the eco shape is greater than 40 years old. So this means that we end up with eco shapes that only have references to the original species occurrence data, which provides transparency without actually displaying the locations. So an example of what that looks like is in the black box. So we have a summary of all the input records that went into creating this range map without showing the precise locations. And we also provided additional information about the taxonomy, so we all, all know that we're talking the same language. What do we, the next step in the process is to put it through the expert review uh, platform, which we are calling the eBar reviewer. So we added in a bunch of features to assist folks as they're doing these reviews. So you can change the base map, you can choose uh, a topographic version, aerial imagery, cartography, or grayscale, depending on your preference. You can also search and zoom to specific locations, such as a uh, provincial or state park, or specific city. We also provided additional context layers like land cover, major lakes, wetlands, or protected areas. And very much uh, like the Mobi app, you can load your own CSV file of point data. But we're also really encouraging people that if you do have data, you can submit it to us so that it can be actually incorporated into the map. We're also allowing people to view unrestricted input data where permissions allow. So an example of what people can view would be the data downloaded from GBIS. And what they cannot view would be something provided by a conservation data center that's covered by a data sharing agreement. We've also allowed people a link to the NatureServe Explorer page so they can get information about the species distribution, the ranking, and taxonomy. We've also gotten a lot of really great feedback on the new version of uh, NatureServe Explorer 2.0. And then again, we have the metadata and taxonomy. So what are we actually asking of the reviewers? So we asked people to think about the review at two scales. One is at the ecoshape level and the other at the overall range map level. So users are assigned species based on their expertise and geographic knowledge. Similarly to the full range, we have metadata at the ecoshape level. So in this example, it's the ecoshape on the far left of the screen that's being lit up. And it's telling us that that's based on an input record from Bison. So uh, the user is then asked to either add an eco shape and assign a presence value um, and then provide a rationale. The rationale comes in the form of a comment and a reference. Alternatively, folks can also choose to remove an eco shape, but they must select a removal reason and again, provide a rationale. Or finally, you can change the presence value. So a common example of that would be a historical eco shape that has more recent survey data and you might want to change the presence value from historical to present. And in terms of how long this is taking people, on average, we're finding that for a smaller range, possibly similar size to what's on the screen, it's taking about 10 minutes, or it could take several hours for some of the larger ranging species, like the bats and the bees, those can take several hours because they might involve hundreds of eco shapes. So then at the sort of bigger picture or overall range level, it's very similar to Moby. We're asking people to provide a star rating and a five comments on the overall range. For example, are we missing data? Um, do we totally miss the mark? And our range does not accurately reflect the species. Folks can then either choose to continue working on the, their review or submit it. All of the ranges are then refined based on this input and all the information is stored in our database for future reference. So again, an overview of what our production process looks like. We start with our ecoshape mosaic or representations of ecosystems. We add in our clean species occurrence data. 
We auto-generate our range using Python code. We push it out to the expert reviewer, which we collect using our online app. We refine the map based on that feedback. We then intend to publish all these maps and some different platforms that we're looking at would be the NatureServe website, Explorer 2.0, Databasin, or ArcGIS Online. Again, these are all gonna be freely available and all the code is on GitHub. And we hope that these become sort of living products that are gonna facilitate long-term continual improvement and uh, all of our maps can be easily regenerated as new data or expertise is available. So how do we see these maps being utilized? So here are some uh, examples for like the key biodiversity area project where they're using our maps to determine the proportion of the total range that is within one of their sites. It can also be used for species at risk recovery and action plans, environmental impact assessments, provincial and territorial species at risk programs, CACELIC static status assessments, and habitat suitability modeling, providing a bounding box for uh, the analysis. So what have we done so far? Um, I'm really excited to say that we have 183 auto-generated maps. So before the maps go out to an expert reviewer, we do a bit of a sanity check, just make sure that there's no major data gaps and make sure that we have an expert reviewer in line and ready to go. So we have already 101 out in review, and I really want to sincerely thank everyone who's taken the time to respond to our survey. We are assigning maps on an ongoing basis, so please try to keep your eye out for the words e-bar in your inbox. Um, we have 31 maps that are complete, and once we've finalized the various platforms that we want to publish on, we hope to sort of get them out the door as they are completed and obviously review as many as possible between now and the fall of this year. So hopefully I've got some people excited about our project and maybe you are interested in participating. So while we're currently focusing on terrestrial key biodiversity area species, um, and you can find a list of what those are on our website, I just wanna note for everyone that the reason that there's no birds on that list is simply because Birds Canada is the lead for the key biodiversity area project within Canada. And it does not mean that we don't intend to create EBAR maps for that taxa in the future. They're just not our priority at the moment. But we are looking for more reviewers of all taxa in the US and Mexico. And specifically, we would love to see more vascular plant experts and insect experts. And then within insects, we would like more beetle, moth, spider, mayfly, and bee folks. We are really interested in working with NatureServe and member programs on any network-wide projects and the use of the eBar Reviewer app. So again, as I mentioned earlier, you can visit our website at that address in order to see a list of our priority species and to fill out our survey if you're interested in either providing additional data or expert review. I also want to uh, really acknowledge the entire team that's working on this project. So there is myself, um, Randall Green, who's the technical coordinator and has been leading a lot of the database development, the app development, and the Python tools. We also have uh, Amy Enns, Suzanne Carrier, Jacqueline Clare, and Patrick Henry, who all provide a lot of expertise and input. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, we have a couple of questions. Why don't we take a, a few questions now and then we can move on to the other presentations um, and perhaps address more questions okay. at the end. Um, so okay. there's a question from Healy Hamilton asking, how were you able to find expert reviews for almost 2,500 species? Were the reviewers volunteers or was funding to support their efforts part of the project? Well, we don't have necessarily, we have about uh, 90 expert reviewers signed on and we have a list of 2,500 species that we want to get reviewed. Um, and we do not have any funding to necessarily support that. So everyone is being, uh, very kind and doing the review pro bono. Um, and so we just have the list of 2,500 and we hope that we will be able to get them all done 
um, within that time. Um, and the second question is from Courtney Baldo and asks, are you doing any ground truly to validate that the species are actually in those areas or is it solely expert review? It is solely expert review. Uh, those are all the questions I have right now, though, if you have other questions you'd like to ask Christine, go ahead and um, put them in the chat. We might have additional time later. Um, and with that, I'll take the screen back. Um, you got the screen? Okay, I have it. Um, and we are going to move on to talking about the map of biodiversity importance, which we also call Moby. Um, before I do that, just Allison, could you make sure that um, Chris Tracy has host privileges, please? Yes. He, he had some internet trouble. Thanks. And also, Regan, we're seeing the presenter view for your- Oh, you are. Shoot. Okay, thank you. I'll get Chris on. Stop that and try again. There you go. All right, um, so many of you um, may have already heard some about this, but um, just this past February, NatureServe released um, the map of biodiversity importance or what we sometimes call MOBI, which is uh, really a series of maps highlighting areas of conservation importance for at-risk species in the United States. Um, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm not going to go into really deep depth on that project, um, but I will give a brief interview, point you to some additional resources, and then I want to hand uh, the presentation over to a couple other members of the NatureServe network who are working on building off the work that we did for the map of biodiversity importance to improve the, our ability to provide defensible species distribution maps um, for imperiled species across the country. And so my co-presenters will be Tim Howard from the New York Natural Heritage Program, Chris Tracy from Pennsylvania Natural Heritage, and Eleanor Gaines from the Oregon Biodiversity Information Center. And that picture there is uh, Tim, Chris, and I looking ahead uh, um, when we were at a conference together earlier this year. Um, so the, the map of biodiversity importance, as I said, was focused on developing maps of priority er areas for imperiled species conservation in the US. Um, and that project resulted in maps like the one I have up on the screen, which is really aggregating information for thousands of species. But to get there, we had to develop detailed habitat information for each of those individual species. And that's really what the presentation today is gonna to focus on. Um, so how we did that uh, was with habitat suitability modeling. Um, we took the, the you know, decades of field data from the NatureServe network and similar to Christine's work, we supplemented that um, with data from other data sets like Bison and GBIF and INAT. Um, and then we combine that information with the environmental predictor data sets. So representations of climate and terrain and land cover and soils by intersecting those known occurrence points with data to characterize the environment and then doing a whole bunch of fancy math and machine learning, we were able to get to maps showing a, predict a probability of predicted habitat for each of the species we modeled. And so the map of biodiversity importance went through this process similar to EBAR in a very automated way, aut automated way for over um, 2,000 species. And what we got out on the other end was things like the, the map shown on, right, on the right, which is the, uh, a habitat suitability surface for, in this case, uh, one of our species, the frosted flatwood salamander. Um, by applying thresholds um, to those predicted probability surfaces, we're able to um, you know, narrow in on areas of just the highest suitability that are likely to support that species. The map showing now on the right is just a thresholded version of that probability surface. Um, and here we've dropped that, that threshold a bit to um, have two different levels of probability. So this is just a really <laughs> generalized overview of what our process was for the map of biodiversity importance. 
But the idea really was just to use these machine learning techniques to try to go from documented occurrence data to a more um, precise but comprehensive map of where species occur on the ground. Why we're so excited about this is uh, really that until we had these approaches for habitat modeling, we were somewhat, somewhat limited in the types of data we as a network could provide on species locations. Um, in the absence of modeling, you know, we really use data that fell into two categories. On the left is um, that documented occurrence data for this species. And this information is insanely useful, you know, without documented occurrence data, you can't do modeling, you can't do projects like EBAR, and you don't have that really rich information that I know this thing is in this place that I've been. However, when maps like that are used for conservation decision making, we know we're under predicting occupied area, we're over predicting unoccupied area, and really the, the accuracy of those maps is so dependent on sampling activity. Because of that, um, you know, often instead range maps are used. And those range maps, again, are, are very useful, um, especially when they're done in manners like the EBAR project, where you know, there's a lot of vetting and a clear process that goes into them. But even still, you know, by their nature, those kind of broad range maps are going to overpredict occupied area. You know, they're going to include places that the species really are unlikely to be within those polygons. And so these habitat suitability modeling efforts really fill in that middle part of the spectrum of biodiversity location data and allow us to create precise products that are based on hypotheses of species habitat, but still allow us to narrow in to those places that imperiled species are most likely to be. Um, what the Map of Biodiversity Importance Project did was allow us to do that type of modeling at scale. You know, species distribution modeling has been um, used for, for decades now, and there's a long history of using it in the NatureServe network. But until the MOBI pro project, we were really doing it on a species by species basis or within a single state. Um, for MOBI, with support from ESRI and Microsoft's AI for Earth program, um, as well as working with the Nature Conservancy, we were able to take data for the very most imperiled species in the United States, thousands of them, and run them through these automated predictive processes to get to habitat maps. What's shown up on the screen now is an example of the outcomes of that process for just you know, six of those 2,000 species. Um, but we did include really a, a variety of taxa in that mapping. So, you know, the vertebrates that are often included in conservation prioritizations, but also aquatic invertebrates like mussels and crayfish, um, over 1,600 vascular plants, um, and pollinator species too, butterflies and skippers and bumblebees. Um, so with, with MOBI, you know, we took the data that we've maintained for all these species, we ran them through this, this iterative um, modeling process and came out the other end with these refined distribution maps. When you stack all those up for all 2,000 species, you get surfaces like this. Um, this is just a simple species richness map for all the species included in MOBI. And this is one of the, the final products that came out of the project and which is now um, freely available online. We did some additional analysis on that, um, you know, looking instead of simply at species richness, looking at range size rarity to get to maps like this, or even going one step further and asking what, what species already are protected in the nation's protected areas and using that to weight range size rarity, to, to narrow in on where are those places in the United States where you have imperiled species with limited range sizes occurring outside protected areas. And that's the map you're seeing up on the screen now. Uh, with these products, we're able to provide a, a whole lot of, of really useful information that can be used for conservation. Um, there's all the last slide I have points you to um, more information on, you know, kind of the outcomes of this process and what we learned along the way. But what we want to focus on today is how we're using what was built for MOBI to drive our efforts to uh, produce 
precise range maps for imperiled species forward at the species level. And so really what I want to talk about is the system we've built that can facilitate this type of modeling. Um, for the, the MOBI project, we really, uh, you know, we're, we're working towards first generation models. Let's take the information we have and try this process. But we did so in a way that allows us to iterate on those models and refine them over time. And the, the diagram here really just shows what that process looked like. And I'm going to talk in some detail about each of these steps, um, because really this is the groundwork that's going to support us as a network as we go forward in generating um, you know, really high quality species models for, for lots of individual species. So we start with our species occurrence data, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides. We combine that with environmental predictor layers. Um, for anybody who's involved in this kind of, has been involved in this kind of modeling, that step of developing the environmental predictor data is absolutely critical to the process and often pretty labor intensive, especially if you're doing that at scale. What the MOBI project enabled us to do was build a national predictor library. Um, I have an example of some of those layers on, on a future slide, but this was hundreds of layers for both terrestrial and aquatic environments that allowed us to you know, pinpoint what particular habitats are for different species that may be responding to different things. Um, the next real key component that we were able to um, bring to scale through this project is the, the computational infrastructure. So I mentioned before that we had a, a Microsoft Azure AI for Earth grant that um, enabled us to, to set up really a, a supercomputer that could do the, the type of crunching necessary to process you know, 30 meter distribution rasters covering the entire country for thousands of species. Um, not only did we kind of have that that computational power, but we were able to design a system that allowed us, you know, to build the scripts to run these models, to build the data management components, um, to organize the data so that uh, the, the process is transparent and we can, uh, it's organized in such a manner that it can be pulled into different products in the future. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and Tim Howard is, is going to talk a little bit about where we're heading next in terms of some of that computational infrastructure and how what we've built can be adapted to support use of ensemble modeling and iteration of models over time, which is one of the big things we're, we're looking at now that we've wrapped up the, the initial MOBI effort. The other really exciting thing that came out of the Map of Biodiversity Importance Project is this online review tool. So Christine talked a little bit about that in the EBAR project. This is one of the great ways those two projects were able to cross pollinate. Um, you know, as I mentioned, MOBI was really an automated process. And anybody can do this kind of automated modeling of you throw some data for a species in, you throw some environmental predictor layers in, you're going to get a surface showing species habitat. Whether that surface is accurate is kind of anyone's guess, right? But what, what the NatureServe network has is this great wealth of biologists and zoologists and botanists who understand the species and can look at those outputs and make sense of them. So we spent um, a, a fair amount of effort developing this online collaborative review tool where we could upload the models, have people look at them, send their feedback, and let us know, um, you know what ha needed to happen to make them better, um, or whether they looked great as they were. And through that, you know, we were able to produce these habitat suitability maps with the ultimate outcome being um, you know, improved conservation. Uh, so now that that is in place, um, you know, we're, we're ready to use it to continue to refine these products and make them better and model new species. I mentioned the environmental predictor library. Um, this is just a sample of some of those data layers. We have over 100 terrestrial layers, so you know, 19 different climate variables, um, different land cover variables, different soils variables. Um, 
We have over 150 aquatic variables that are tied to the NHD medium resolution stream segments. And Chris Tracy is going to talk a little bit about um, our aquatic modeling methods and where we're heading next with that. Um, but this really is a, a major resource as we move forward with additional modeling efforts for the the lower 48 United States. I should mention uh, the map of biodiversity importance was only for the lower 48 US. That was largely because the predictor data we have um, was confined to that area, but we certainly are looking at how these same methods could be applied to, to Canada and the rest of the United States and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, the infrastructure we built, the, the scripts that we developed, and the metadata we developed um, are another resource going forward. Um, we wanted our models to be very transparent. Um, we wanted them to be replicable, and we wanted to be able to iterate on them in ways that we could track. Um, this, what's showing on the screen now, is the metadata that gets automatically generated with each model. and um, you know, is the record of, of what we did and how we did it. One thing I wanted to particularly point out is this little table here. This is an adaptation of a rubric for the development and delivery of species distribution models to inform decision making. Um, so about a, a year ago, this paper came out in bioscience that provides guidelines um, for how species distribution models um, should be developed and kind of interpreted for different uses. And so by following these guidelines and pretty clearly laying out how our models fit into the picture, that sets them up to be used in, um, you know, potentially in regulatory contexts or, or for different management decisions people can make. Um, and we've kind of laid the groundwork to make it easy for people to interpret the data um, and use them for, for appropriate uses. Um, and then I mentioned the model review tool. Here's just a, a screenshot of that. Um, there's more information and a little demo on this online. Um, and Eleanor is going to be talking about how Oregon, Oregon has already adapted it um, for a project they're working on. But the idea with this is just to, to provide a framework to tap into the expertise of um, the the full nature serve network and people outside the network um, in order to to validate the information and make sure that what we're producing really makes sense to people who know the species on the ground and we're continuing to you know what we started with with this tool was fantastic what we learned from it was really um helped the the moby project but we're looking ahead to ways we can adapt it and and make it even better and so this is, this is where we stand now. Um, but in addition to this infrastructure, we also have this great resource, which is those 2,500 first generation habitat models. I say 2,500 here, I said 2,200 before. Um, we actually modeled species for Moby that didn't end up going into the, the final map, some of the G3 species. But what, what we're sitting on at the moment is, um, you know, this vast library of habitat models that we can begin using for decision making. And what we got out of the model review process is some additional information on how well those models perform. So we know from our reviewers that um, over 500 of the models, people looked at them and said, this, this looks like a reasonable map of habitat for this species. It's pretty good to use. Um, and there was, a, that's the, the dark green at the top of the graph, there was a, a number, uh, another hundred something species that some re reviewers looked at and said it looked pretty good, but we weren't able to get review across the entire species range. Um, the things in yellow and red here are species that reviewers looked at and said either, you know, this seems reasonable, but you might want to tweak it or, wow, this really doesn't work. Um, that information is fantastic because it lets us know what to do next. Many of those medium scoring models and even the low scoring models might turn to a green model if we adjust the threshold we use or, or whatnot. Um, and we, so the next step there is really to take a closer look and see how those models could be improved. 
And then we have a whole bunch of models that just haven't gotten reviewed. So we're not quite sure yet how well they've done, but we'd, we'd like to follow up and find out and figure out how we can use that data. I'm gonna skip over this slide in the interest of time, but um, where we're going next is we're, we're really thinking about how to integrate this information into the full spectrum of biodiversity location information that NatureServe can provide. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, the new NatureServe Explorer is a great venue for sharing some of this data, and we're looking at that and other means of getting this information out there. Additional spatial functionality is coming to that tool, and eventually where we'd like to be is being able to provide information on documented occurrences, but also these maps of likely habitat and range information, uh, like the EBAR range maps. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the other presenters, starting with Tim, but I would encourage folks who want to learn more about the map of biodiversity importance, as well as our habitat suitability modeling efforts more generally, to visit this um, HSM hub site that we've built. There's a bunch of great story maps there on the process. There's a list of the species we've modeled, um, and as well as some, some videos and other resources. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Tim and then we'll return to questions at the end. So Tim, do you want to share your screen? Hi Regan, hi everybody. Um, yes, I think I can do that. Do, does everyone see a slide? Uh, nope. Nope. Okay. I, I have your slides Shit. too. If, oh, it's starting. How about now? Got it. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Regan. That was a fabulous introduction and overview. And I really, I have three slides. I really, this is really lightning. And I really just want to go over some thoughts about uh, where we've been, the current status, and where we're headed in terms of really keeping track of our modeling and what we're doing um, with tracking status and tracking how we're, how we're going about doing these, these efforts and how we can keep track of what we're doing. So let's bring that back, that awesome salamander, the frosted flatwood salamander, and uh, there it is on the left there. And this is pretty much where we've been, right? As you, you have your information and you build your models, and then we do a wonderful thing with those models. We did get, we do have other review in there and stuff, and, but we really want to look at that full cycle. And that is to take that model, um, uh, build a suite of different algorithms, right? Use, for example, random forests and max and and boosted regression trees or something like that and then combine those together to make an ensemble of your models um, because that give you, gives you more power, gives you variance about the models you're building, and then use that information to help you go out there and do more field work and look for the critters you're looking for. Yes, that is a turtle trap, and yes, we wouldn't use turtle traps to find salamanders, but you get the idea, right? And, um, and then we would, and then of course we use the fieldwork information as well as perhaps our expert knowledge, which is what we've done at the, po at the current mo moment to, uh, to do our external review and then feed that back into our known locations and feed that information into the model where we've built and perhaps do another cycle. But this really, this is a feedback loop and this is really where we want to be in the long run. So, um, that's that's what I really want to get your minds thinking about is how do we best track this full cycle and this whole this information as we're doing. So again, the current the original design was is something along this lines where we had we have we have a uh, and this is this is how we have it set up how we have our uh, modeling system set up with a portable database and this is how we've got it set up on on our. Um, uh, scripts in, on GitHub is that we have a portable database that tracks the inputs and the outputs. It's a SQLite database, and it um, and and it tracks it tracks which model we've run, um, but it doesn't it, it it doesn't take us that next step forward to help us do that full looping kind of thing. And so there's the problem. The problem is that we need to be able to track 
are manual steps. Um, we need, um, in the sense that we need the team members to be able to say, all right, we've got the points for this species. It's ready for our, our um, modeling scripts. All right, we've, we've checked out the range, um, the range uh, information about the species and it's ready to be input there. And so the uh, SQLite sort of backend database doesn't let us give, us give us a GUI for tracking how we're doing things over time. And we want to be able to input, um, uh, view that model feedback and have that model feedback that, that the model review tool gives us integrated into our, our system. And we want to be able to um, enable those sub models and track models um, for ens ensembles. And we want to handle the iterative runs. And so this original design uh, needs some improvements and needs some growing on. And we need to, we need to work on a little bit. So we're, we're all, we're, we're working towards something along this setup where we have uh, and the, a cloud SQL server system, a, a, a serve database that has a front, we're using front end access to a Microsoft access database. So the Microsoft access system hits on those, those serve tables in the back end. And then we can view at the top end, the species that we're interested in and we can um, uh, accommodate uh, the different components we're thinking about. So if you think about ensembles, you have your ensemble models, and within each species, we would have a, a tab that tracks the different ensembles, the different algorithms that go into it, and then the synthesis models, the ensemble model as well. So we wanna be able to do that. That's sort of part of our design. We're trying to keep track of that. We also need the same system to have tables that track our species reviewer information. So there's a tab that has reviewer comments and then finally, all that is nested inside our cycling. And so we're calling that model cycles where we have different versions of the larger system and that fits down together. So here for, um, if you, you know, we're all, many of us are database people and we're tracking what's going on um, with our databases. We have our species name up top. And then within that, we might have external models we wanna track as well as a cycle the, the sort of full cycle of everything that goes on inside that model cycle or that out or that that loop and within that did we review it did we include the species in our should we include the species do we have range maps defined and other things we're tracking tr tracking at that cycle and then we have our models that are within that and our reviewers and things like that within that so the idea is that we're moving forward into a way that um, a user then, like Regan, can then come up and say, okay, do, what's our status for modeling for this species? And we can pull up um, our, our GUI, our front end database, and say, yes, we've built a model for that a month ago. We have, our, we have a status for that. We have these different ensembles built for it, and, um, and we're ready for review. Or we haven't built any models for this species yet, but it's coming up the pike, and we're, we're building it with the current project that's going on here, and that kind of thing. And so um, I really, the, the point, point, point of, of introducing this to you is to help, um, if, help you think about this at this early stage and think about, well, how can we build this most effective for the network and for our programs that, that this type of tracking system can really help us along in the long run, keep track of how our models are going, what we've got going into it and, and all the pieces that are fitting together. That's it. That's my lightning presentation on where I think where we're headed towards um, trying to track uh, the network um, development of, of the modeling system. And I think I'll turn it right back over to you, Regan. We can pass it on as well. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, Chris, can you screen share? Yes, I can. We got it. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Um, well, well, thanks, Regan, and thanks, Tim, and thanks, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our aquatic modeling. Um, so over the years, you know, um, as Regan mentioned, we've been doing a lot of modeling for um, um, across the network. Most of that has concentrated in the terrestrial realm. Um, but we have had some work in it um, um, in doing aquatic models. And when we talk about aquatic models, we're really talking about lodic models and flowing, you know, um, 
mildly for species that occur in flowing water. So um, Pennsylvania's done some work, Virginia's done some work, a few other states as well. This work's varied in this methodology. Um, some of it has been pixel-based, really just trying to translate the terrestrial methods um, into, um, into the aquatic realm. Um, other, um, um, some of the more recent efforts have been based on um, flow lines from the National Hydrography Data Set, um, our um, previous versions of that. But Moby really gave us a chance to try to formalize our methods. We, you know, we rebuilt this. We, we rebuilt our scripts um, to handle aquatic data. We looked at generating a lot of aquatic data, nation, a nationwide set of aquatic data, um, and tried to really figure this out. Um, so we learned a few things. Um, well, first thing we learned is that we could successfully model 600 aquatic species. Um, you know, that was a big question when we started, and we did it. So that counts as a success. Um, when reading the reviews, you know, we got a lot of great reviews. This chart here shows some of the review, you know, um, some of the reviews we got by aquatic, um, by the species in the various aquatic groups. Um, you know, as Regan mentioned before, we didn't get everything reviewed, um, but the reviews were you know, generally, you know, high or medium. We had a couple low um, review scores. Um, but these were pretty much consistent with what our biologists thought with our EO data. Um, you know, um, we got some comments back saying they, this model really, con um, really confirms that there's a lack of habitat in this particular area, and this is what probably explains why we never found the species here. We had a lot of challenges. Um, the range maps we used for these, they were either too large or um, too small. Um, we had a lot of trouble figuring out what our modeling envelope was going to be um, you know, for this. Um, so in some areas, we predicted whole swaths you know, of the country as being within the range for the species um, wasn't the best way of doing it. Um, we had lots of other issues. Um, the NHD, uh, the medium resolution NHD doesn't include a lot of the headwater and smaller tributaries, uh, the first order streams. So some of those were missing. This really affected some of our crayfish models. Any of our Atlantic species didn't perform well because um, we were looking at mostly flowing water, so we didn't have information like bathymetry or the substrate state or what's, what, um, what was the trophic condition of the lake. Um, we overpredicted a lot. It wasn't great in the desert southwest. You know, we predicted habitat in a lot of streams that do not have um, year-round water. Um, so that was an issue of data quality and also some impacts from the EO mapping. Every, you know, not, um, our states um, map data differently, um, so we have um, uh, so we have some issues with that. But overall, you know, fairly successful. You know, we learned a lot, you know, through this process. And just thinking about some of the challenges we have, and um, and these challenges are true for any type of modeling that we're doing, but in particular for freshwater species. Um, you know, we are looking not just at a single pixel and is that pixel habitat, but you know what, ha um, you know, well. I guess first, where in the landscape is it? You know, there's biogeograph there's biogeographic um, issues with freshwater species distribution. In this case, we're talking about mussels, but um, you know, are you in the um, interior drainage? Are you in the Atlantic slope drainage? Everything, you know, questions like that. But also watershed characteristics, and just you know, so what is not only at the site where you are, but what is also upstream? What are the climate influences on that? You know, trying to integrate these env these environmental predictors over large landscapes. For mussels, we have um, the um, host fish distribution. Where you know, um, are the are the fish that are needed for this particular part of the mussel's um, life cycle? You know, in that area, is it accessible to them? We have microhabitat characteristics, things like shear stress within the stream of, of, of water flowing, habitat stability. Um, you know, also, you know um, all sorts of other factors that are in stream that are very hard to go and get environmental predictor data for. And then we have issues of threats and stressors. And these are, um, um, and you know, the actual influence on these is something that we need to, you know, that we're trying to think about with the models. You know, are we trying to predict currently occupied habitat or potential habitat? If we removed some of those threats, you know, if we cleaned up, um, abandoned mine dra drainage, you know, can we predict that this might be good habitat for restoration or reintroduction, um, you know, um, within, so to try and incorporate all that information. Um, we're looking, um, so we're beginning to look a lot at what 
what are the important predictors, which ones we're missing, and how we can improve this data going into the future. But also, and this is something that came up locally um, for us in Pennsylvania, is you know, how do we use these models um, locally? The aquatic models are pretty coarse. We're looking um, the average stream, um, you know, um, length of a stream reach and the median resolution NHD is somewhere between one and two kilometers. So like between um, between two points um, on the um, you know on this map. So it's you know fairly coarse. Um, you know, when you go down to look at that, you know, we're looking at a probability value for that stream sec, um, you know, for that stream segment that says, yes, there's a high chance it's here, but where in it? You know, if we just did one survey, you know, like a 200 meter line transect, which looks like this data represents, if we get that species there, it doesn't mean we validated it. The model's validated. If we happen to miss it because we put our transect in the wrong area, you know, did that model fail? So we're trying to go and you know, look at this and figure out how we can use these, you know, more beyond um, beyond the screening layer. Um, and what does it take to validate it? Um, it's fairly, it's a fairly interesting, you know, question um, because um, the terrestrial models we can get at such a finer scale, this 30 meter resolution currently, you know, we can evaluate that through, uh, through an aerial photo. It's a lot harder to evaluate these terrestrial models. So, something we're thinking about. Um, and also um, beyond just that validation, you know, how can we go and use these? You know, um, we have a project locally here where we're looking um, at ecosystem flows. And you know, can we use these models to inform any part of that river management work? So um, many ongoing questions there. So moving into some of the next steps for this, um, you know, to solve some of these issues, we're looking at moving to the high resolution NHD. This has almost been released for the entire country. Uh, it's just pretty much an area right around the Great Lakes um, to be done. Um, so moving to that, but there's issues. The data model has changed. We need to create a whole suite of environmental pictures. We have nearly 160 available for the median resolution, but we don't have all that yet for the high resolution. So how are we gonna do that? Um, are there new and improved environmental predictors, things like seasonal flow instead of mean annual flow? Um, you know, does that get at predicting some of these in-stream characteristics a little bit better? Um, you know, can we, you know, can we have a variable for um, in-stream substrate? Is it gravel? Is it bedrock? Is it sand or silt? Things like that. This understanding of the threats and stresses I mentioned before, and then also how do we validate and use these models are like kind of our next steps, um, things that we're working on. So, you know, as, as a network, as we talk about developing more of these projects, um, you know, can we incorporate any of these steps into that work? You know, how do we fundraise for it? You know, creating environmental data nationwide at the high resolution NHD is a pretty heavy lift. So, you know, how can we make that happen effectively? <laughs> so. It's kind of where we are um, right now overall with the freshwater modeling. Um, you know, we of course welcome feedback and questions and you know, help you know, looking for help to keep moving this forward. Thanks very much, Chris. And I apologize we're running a little bit over, but Eleanor has a great um, really brief talk on how they're utilizing the model review tools. So if if you can please stay on the, the phone. Thanks, Eleanor. It looks like sure. it's working. Do you have my show my slides up there? We do. Thank. Great. So I will run through this quickly. Um, so in in Oregon, we've been um, we've been working on inductive and deductive species distribution models um, for quite some time. And um, we've, we've developed models for vertebrate species and um, we're working on uh, models for fish, high priority plants, almost all the um, vasculars and federally listed invertebrates. But we've really struggled with a way to, to get um, partners to review the underlying data, particularly the base ranges. So until now, we've not had a tool where um, 
on the ground experts could comment on the presence or absence of a particular species in their corner of the state. But when we participated in the MOBI review, we thought that the review tool could provide us with uh, an accessible way for our partners to give us the feedback we were looking for. So we're still working on pulling this together, but I wanted to take this opportunity to just quickly show you what we've been working on. Um, we modified the MOBI review code to limit the scope to Oregon, although it could certainly be extended to any network program. Um, and I want to emphasize that we're interested in um, getting information on all of our species, not just the species of conservation concern. We changed the base mapping unit from 10 digit hux to 12 digit hux, which allows us to document Oregon ranges at a finer scale. So we've got about five times as many 12 digit hux as 10 digit hux. So we can display a species distribution at a scale that supports conservation decision making. Just like in the MOBI review tool, users select a species and then comment on the overall distribution or um, individual sub watersheds. And this is all fake data that I'm showing you. <laughs> but um, so in our tool, we've added the ability to select and comment on multiple hucks at once. Um, when we were using the MOBI review tool, we were a little frustrated that um, you could only comment on one huck at a time. So um, in our tool, users can either control click on multiple sub watersheds or they can use this polyline tool highlighted in yellow to draw a shape and then select all the um, hucks that intersect that shape. So this allows users to flag an entire group of hucks for addition, deletion, or comment all at once. And we believe that this functionality coupled with Moby's easy to, um, ease of use will um, be essential for the tool to appeal to and be used by our stakeholders. This is important because we're relying on experts volunteering time um, to view the ranges. We hope to get feedback from professional biologists with the Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, our state um, agency partners, and university researchers. And we're interested not only in individual species experts who can comment on a species um, range within the state, but also local experts who might just know about all the species in their corner of the state. Um, Orbic will administer the tool via password access, much like um, Moby was administered, and it'll allow us to reconcile conflicting comments through a hidden review mode. And then we can follow up with users to resolve conflicts or request additional information. We're attaching a date to all records so that we can document changes in distributions over time. And the tool will be hosted on our um, Oregon Explorer website. Uh, this is a natural resources digital library that is a cooperative project between the Institute for Natural Resources, which is our um, parent organization, and the Oregon State University Library. Oregon Explorer is a really great fit for the review tool because they already provide a wide array of place-based natural resource information and tools. So just to quickly wrap it up, um, given just a few changes to the MOBI review tool, um, we now have a platform that we believe our partners will welcome and most importantly use. Um, we really thank NatureServe for making the code available to us. And looking forward, um, we'll use the expert reviewed HUC distributions to both improve our um, habitat suitability models for almost all of our fauna and also to uh, provide improved distribution maps for most of our vascular plants. In the future, we'd also like to use the tool to get feedback on some inducted um, habitat suitability models for threatened and endangered species. But right now we're focusing on getting really solid distributions for all our species statewide. Um, and that's about all I've got. Thank you very much, Eleanor. I've been trying to keep up with uh, the comments uh, and questions coming in, so there should be typed answers for most of those. So we do have one for Eleanor on whether the um, 
source code for the edits you've made to the review tool is available on GitHub. Um, we will post it there. We're still tweaking it, but yes. And then there's just, there's a shout out at well that the, the review tool in general has been very helpful in a, a few different contexts. And I will say um, we at, we are in conversation with Esri about additional functionality to the review tool. That's kind of one of the things that came out of the Moby project is kind of the hunger for that and um, different ways it could be adapted. Uh, one of the things we're working on, for example, is is like the ability for users to tweak the thresholds themselves if you're looking at a distribution model, uh, which would be very useful. Having looked at the reviews that came in for all the Moby species, it would have been great if the species, the people who knew the species could provide that kind of feedback. Um, I believe um, that is it. I really want to thank everybody who presented today and I appreciate uh, people staying on the line as we went a little bit over. Um, we had Healy Hamilton, would you like to make a comment? Uh, I, yes, I would. Um, but so, uh, what, so thank you so much for organizing this, Regan, and to everybody who participated, um, Eleanor and Christine and Tim and Chris, it's so cool to see where we're headed. The theme that I noticed that I think we really need, like the question we need to ask ourselves as a network is, how can we better facilitate the model review process? Christine needs that for, uh, like thousands of species in the Moby project, you'll, you'll notice from the slides that Regan showed is that even though we had lots of communication, lots of advanced planning, we offered funding to programs who could do batches of species, we still ended up with almost half of our species unreviewed. Eleanor is talking about the need for species review. Th this this is a strength of our network that we need to understand better how to capitalize upon. Yet, I mean, what we're seeing here is the future of conservation, iterative refined range mapping. No one can do this like NatureServe can, but there's a critical step that we still haven't fully figured out how to execute as a network. And so it's just kind of a question and a statement for all of us to consider how do we best mobilize our natural history expertise, because it is a very important missing link, uh, not totally missing, but partially missing, that we really have to solve in order for us to be able to um, reach the vision that Tim Howard presented of iterative distribution modeling. Uh, so I just really wanted us to think about that uh, as we move forward and, and figure out how to do that. Uh, the, the, having the model reviewed is an essential step in, in being able to have defensive refined range maps. And that's what we want, the authoritative distribution information um, for the species that we track. Um, thank you, Regan, for giving me that opportunity. Thanks very much, Hilly. Well, with that, I think we'll conclude today's session. Thank you to everybody who joined us and all the panelists. And please continue to uh, tune in for more of these virtual uh, Biodiversity Without Boundary sessions. Have a great afternoon.